Tonight I'd like to take a few minutes and look at the book of Zechariah. There is a model we're using for the way this book is laid out in two major segments. That model basically suggests that the first part of the book is all about things going on at the time of Zechariah, and the last part of the book are things that are coming attractions largely related to the first and second coming of Messiah. Now, those aren't bulletproof. You can kick holes in some of the models, but we're going to do the best we can to try and represent for you what it looks like this book really contains. If you're not familiar with this book, you are missing one of the gems of Scripture. And the reason is just because it has the most unbelievably clear exposure to the spiritual world behind the physical. Let, let's first set this prophet in the array of prophets, because sometimes people read the prophets of Scripture and they feel like it's like uh, over and over and over, kind of redundancy of one saying the same as the next. The truth is God communicated through a number of voices, prophet, prophetic voices in different times, and what seems repetitive is actually God offering counsel and direction in four different time periods. The first time period is just after the United Kingdom died off. That's Saul, David, and Solomon. And basically it imploded and fell apart in disarray. Nineteen kings followed in the northern kingdom. And over a period of about 206 years, they separated themselves from Judah in the south and became their own independent kingdom. All 19, all 19 out of 19 were wrong. They were in disagreement with the temple and defiled before God and followed after the footsteps of the very first of those kings, Jeroboam or Jeroboam I. And they all lived in rebellion. Now, during that time, God raised up first speaking prophets like Elijah and Elisha in the school of the prophets. But then a series of prophets during the time of the divided kingdom with the north and the south existed. And, and in fact, I find seven prophets that fall into that period. Obadiah is probably first, followed by Joel, Jonah, Amos, and then Isaiah, Micah, and Hosea. And during that time period, God doesn't only address the needs of one kingdom, the north or the south, but also the people around Israel and Judah that affect the narrative. So Jonah, for instance, goes to a people that is not his own. After the northern kingdom tragically fell, taken away by the Assyrians in 722-21, and by the way, the northern kingdom started being chewed up in 732 in the northern edges, so it was a long slide downhill. By the time that the northern kingdom had been taken away, there's now a series of prophets that are raised. Three prophets come up to talk specifically to the time of Judah alone. This is a 136-year period after the northern kingdom is destroyed. It's a, during a time when there's oppression, when Judah is undergoing having lost most of its cities, even though it still had Jerusalem. The northern kingdom fell. The southern kingdom basically got squashed down to almost nothing and was a vassal of its former self. Judah was stripped of its wealth, of its prosperity, and there were some kings like Josiah that rose up and tried to, you know, even things out. But even during that time, God used a couple of prophets like Habakkuk, who will raise up an argument against the, the injustices of his day, or uh, Zephaniah, or Nahum, Nahum, uh, who talks about God and the way God is going to work specifically to warn the Assyrians that they're going to be destroyed. So you have these three books during that time that appear to be during the issue of Judah alone. Now, eventually, Judah doesn't get the idea. They eventually go into captivity as well. And so you know that there were three major prophets that were all during the time of the exile. In Jerusalem, there was Jeremiah sitting on the Mount of Olives watching uh, Jerusalem be dis uh, just taken apart. Daniel had been carted away in the 606 movement over into Babylon, and then Ezekiel was carted away in 597, and by 586, when everything fell apart, you have Ezekiel, Daniel, and Jeremiah recording the two sides of this terrible exile. Well, God didn't forget his people. He sent them back. And you end up with seven more books that come in the, what we would call post-exilic. These are the ones after the return when God is saying, look, I brought you back, but can we not do this again? 
Can, can you get what it was I was trying to say through all the array of prophets I've given you? And so he has a book, Ezra 1 through 6, which is it's only half of a book now, but that was its own book originally. And then Zechariah and Haggai, uh, books like Esther, Nehemiah, Malachi. And then at the end of the Hebrew Scriptures is First and Second Chronicles to review the entire Hebrew Scriptures from the creation of Adam all the way through the return. So we're talking about that last segment, the post-exile return, and that's where Zechariah fits into our program. Zechariah is 14 chapters. But I want to just give you five quick facts that you can hang Zechariah on that will help you to at least get a sense of what he's trying to do. He is a post-exilic prophet, so we'll use that as number one. Second, as a post-exilic prophet, his objective was to try and get people coming back to Israel, coming back to Jerusalem to get a passion for God and to get the temple back up and running and to re restore and reignite worship in Jerusalem. And literally, when I say reignite, I mean start the fire on the altar and get it going. It's interesting because Zechariah is written about four years before the temple is rededicated. The temple is rededicated in 516. This is written in the beginning around 520 B.C. And I already mentioned to you a third thing, and that is that the book has two major parts. The part that deals with what's going on at the time of Zechariah and the part that's predictive prophecy mostly for the future. Does that mean that in the second box there's no present tense stuff and in the first box there's no predictions? No, but that's just a way to kind of gather together for a model to help us understand the book. It's interesting because the first part of the book does three different presentations of problems they're going through right then. So if you look at the chart, you'll find that there are eight different visions. And this is, I think, one of the coolest parts of the book, the part where God pulls back the curtain and allows Zechariah to see what's going on behind what appears to be going on. There's a physical and a spiritual world, and you're going to see through the veil. The second part is God instructs specifically Zechariah to help bolster Joshua the high priest and get him back in there, give him a nice new uniform and help him to get in there and do his job. And then the last part, confusion that comes up between fasts and feasts. When do we stop crying about the temple we lost and start celebrating the temple we, we've gotten? How do we know how much should be memory and tradition and how much we should rid ourselves of that for the sake of new celebration? And so that will be one of the confusion points. Then the second half of the book, he will deal with the first coming and second coming of Messiah, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. There are some simple keys to the book, and I'm going to ask you to open your Bible to Zechariah chapter 1 in the first six verses, and I think you'll see one of those interesting keys. The book opens up in November of 520 BCE. And says, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, son of Berechiah, the son of Edu, saying, the Lord was very angry with your fathers, therefore say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, declares the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Now, stop your reading right there, because the introduction sets up some very important things. First, the writer, Zechariah, is the words God remembers. And he's a writer to say, God has remembered something about your fathers. I warned them. They didn't listen. I'd like you to do something different. I think God made clear that one of the foundational principles of the book, and that is that he distanced himself from them because they distanced themselves from obedience. God is absolutely for you when you're for, for obeying his word. And, and the truth of the matter is, he says, your fathers enraged me. Look at where they are. They're gone. But I'd like to do something different with you. Are you willing to return? It's interesting because look at the formula for distance and drawing near. Remember that throughout the scripture, the formula is always, always the same. Draw near to me, says the Lord. Then I will draw near to you. Now, some of you experience the opposite. You found that you weren't seeking God and he met you in a place you didn't know he was going to be. So I'm not trying to say that God is limited to this option. I'm saying that his normal call is for your obedience to precede his coming and helping you to walk the next step. That that's the normal way he does. Don't ever tell God he's not allowed to do things because he'll do something that's just the opposite just you know, to mess with you. But uh, here's what I know. I know that we don't have the right 
to say, well, in my family, that's just how we do it. He said, I saw what your fathers did. Don't set your standard by them. They failed. You're going to need to look in a different direction and stop doing what's been happening. If you want to reap something different, you got to change what you sow. It's also important that uh, we, we look at the word in verse 3, in verse 4, and verse 6. Did you notice there's a title for God? Yahweh Tzvaot. The word is for the supreme commander of the armies of the heavens. Now, think about this for a minute. As he launches into this, God from heaven, as the supreme commander of the armed forces of heaven, speaks. And the word Tzvaot is actually from the word Sabal. It's a word for uh, an appointed time, like a, a time when kings make war. And literally what he says is, this is the Lord speaking uh, as the one who is alive in this world, who is already working in the spiritual and the physical realm, this is the commander for the time of battle during a battle in the spiritual world. In other words, God introduces himself as a commander in a battle. I, it's hard for people to understand when they find God the very first time. If you came to Jesus Christ, you were born into a, a raging spiritual battle even before there was a church and even before the time of Christ. If you were a follower of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there was an enemy. And there always has been because there's a spiritual world since the fall that is at odds with God. So that helps us tie the rest of the book. The, the introduction helps us see that everything we're going to read about in this book is God calling a people to return to him, but the God of heaven in the spiritual realm is going to talk to them about physical things that are going on on earth because those two worlds run side by side. I'd like you to think for a few moments about the very first section here. Zechariah is going to become like a signet ring, an impression ring of God's stamp of authentication and royal authority on what's going to happen in this text. So when you open it up, I want you to notice that from verses, uh, verse, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 7 says, On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is in the month of Shabbat, the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, son of Berechia, son of Ido, as follows. I saw at night. And this begins a rapid fire vision. If you follow this vision, it's going to walk us all the way through chapter 6. So hang on. But I want you to just move very quickly with me through what he sees. The vision of God doing something. And its purpose is to encourage you, not to discourage you, not to freak you out or spook you, but actually to encourage you. One of the things that people seem to be doing is they got back to Jerusalem. They started to build the temple. Governmental re regulations shut them down. The zoning board got bribed, and all of a sudden the temple came to a halt. I'm using different terminology than, than the scriptures, but you understand what I mean by that. And the people were, frankly, not all that excited. And prophetic understanding of the word required that they see something beyond the politics. Listen to me very carefully, because there are an awful lot of believers today that think Washington is running your life. That's not true. Washington is the symptom. Somewhere between the battle and the heavenlies is the actual reality. Washington is the symptom. So here's what I see. In verse 8 of chapter 1, he starts to watch what I'm going to call in verses 8 through 11, a simple patrol. I want you to understand something. In order to understand God's perspective on things, you have to smack yourself and change your view of reality. To God, this isn't reality. This is the effect of a cause. Reality is what doesn't change in a hundred million million years will still be around. None of this will. The temporal world is temporary. And so this is what he says. He says, let me just use the Randy reading in the White Spaces version for verses 8, 11, 8 through 11, okay? It says, um, I, I saw an angel in a red on a red horse standing among myrtle trees in a ravine. There was a herd of various colored horses behind him. And I asked, what are these men? What are they doing in this forest? And they said, these are those whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. And the patrol reports back from the angel of the Lord that says, the earth is peaceful and quiet. Now, stop right there. Zechariah starts his book seeing a patrol of angelic beings. There's an unseen world around us. 
There are people passing through our day and we don't see them. And I use the term persons more liberally. There are angelic realities going on in our world. And then if you get down to verses 12 through 17, not only are there angelic realities, but there's an interface between the two. The angel of the Lord asks, how long will you allow the earth to, 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 to be quiet since Jerusalem has laid waste 70 years? And the Lord comforts the angel and he turns to him and he says, God is jealous for Jerusalem and he's angry at the nations uh, that added to her disaster and I'm going to restore my people again. And what does that tell you? That tells you not only are angels moving around patrolling the earth, but it also tells you that, first of all, they don't know the future. That's important to remember. They have the promises of God just like you, but you don't know your future and they don't know theirs. In that way, you are similar. So they're asking questions. How do I know they don't know the future? Because why would they ask if they already knew? So the truth is, they don't know the future, and what God is doing is he's unfolding a story in front of them, but something else. They're involved in the process of the political realities of their time. Why are angels worried about whether or not Jerusalem is up and running again? Why does it matter to them? Because it does. The reality is there's a spiritual world and a physical world, and behind it they are interfacing often. And, and what, if you keep on reading, go all the way down to verses 18 to 21, here's what you'll find. Because there's an unseen world, I have to recognize that what appears to be reality is actually the effect, not the cause. Hang in there with me for just a second. He says, I saw four horns. I asked about them. I was told that they were powers that scattered Israel and Judah. I saw craftsmen, and an angel explained that they would be sent to shake the powers that would restore Judah. Here, here's what he says. It's essential that I understand that what looks like a political turnover, what looks like some kind of voting tsunami, is actually a spiritual action. That, that reality is what's happening in the spirit world, and what I see in the voting booth, or what I see in the collapse of a government, or what I see in the overthrow or coup, is actually the symptom of something going on in the spiritual world. You know, it's interesting because Paul said that to us in Ephesians 6, didn't he? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, powers, against world forces of darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. He wasn't saying we never wrestle against things physical. If you're on a diet, you wrestle against things physical. Amen? Okay, but the point is that, that that's not all there is to it, that there is even in the physical world a component of the spirit. Now, you get to chapter 2, and one of the great encouragements that comes out of this whole kind of investigation into the spiritual world is found in, in these 13 verses of chapter 2. It says, When an angel went to measure the restored Jerusalem, I heard angels passing the word of the Lord of Jerusalem that Jerusalem was going to in, in, be enlarged beyond its walls. God was going to protect her. He said, I'm going to bring them back just like I scattered them, and they're going to dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Rejoice! Many other nations are going to join themselves to her. The Lord is going to renew Jerusalem. Isn't that great? A couple things I observed in chapter 2. First of all, the angels didn't carry the right stuff. So the angels are on our team, but they don't get it all right either. That's important to know. Second, I mean, I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm just trying to make it real, okay? The, the, the second thing I would tell you is that God would be expanding his, his, his people, and all of that's great, but the whole point is there's a purpose to what God is pulling off on his plan. So you end up with this sense that there's this other world, that God is at work in the other world, and that he's working a plan. And that as he works the plan, there are times when he will strip his people down, and there are times he will add to them. And that has to match his plan. Go to chapter 3. When you get into chapter 3, verses 1 to 10, the enemy of God's plan for his people is the world, the flesh, and the devil, right? We don't, we don't even have to get out of bed or go anywhere else to, to have one of the three enemies battling us because the enemy looks just like us because it's us. The old man is still with us. But for, for believers of every age, they have to become aware of something very important. If you don't have Zechariah 3 marked in your Bible, you need to put a marker right there. You need to come back to this chapter. The chapter is all about how the high priest got discouraged. Because one of Satan's high points of attack will be on leaders. I spend my time encouraging and talking to leaders, and I'm telling you that, that 
The enemy puts a target on the back of leadership. And the further you will go with the gospel and the more you will do in making disciples, the more that that will be ratcheted up in your life. And, and Joshua was literally down and depressed and discouraged. He was the high priest. He was a buddy of Zacharias. Zechariah thought, well, I wonder why my buddy's so depressed. And God showed him. He, he allowed him to peer through the veil of the physical. And here's what he saw. He saw the high priest standing there and Satan putting mud pies on him and indicting him with, you're dirty and you don't deserve this and you shouldn't be able... Zechariah 3 reminds you that sometimes when you think you're encouraging somebody because they're maybe a little down, that what they might be is under attack. And it's easy for us to see the symptom and, not, and misdiagnose it. You're just cranky and you're tired. Well, that might be true, but it also might be you're also under attack. When you're under attack, you're going to feel things that are inordinate and wrong for who you are. And what was God's word to the angels? Get him cleaned up. Get him a new uniform. Put it on him. He needs help in the spiritual realm. Now stop right there and let me just encourage you. All the encouragement in the world, all the vacations in the world, when you are under a spiritual attack, will not change how bad you feel. What you need is prayer and help in the spiritual realm. So the truth is chapter 3 just, I think, is a, a marvelous passage, but i got to move on to chapter 4. You get to chapter 4, and just like the enemy dis secretly discourages leaders, God has back channels to give provision. And I love this. Basically, the story in chapter 4 is, I fell asleep, and I was roused by an angel as he pointed to a vision of a menorah, a lampstand of gold, and it had a refilling bowl with seven spouts on top of it, and beside the menorah on either side was an olive tree on the right and on the left. And the angel explained that the refilling spouts as the work of God's Spirit was empowering and completing uh, the, those who were involved in the temple and Zerubbabel and, and Joshua, and God was giving them provision through His Spirit. Just like the enemy attacks and is behind the scenes and you don't always know it, so God provides in ways you can't believe. You know why I find that encouraging? Because I got kids. And my children are now adult children. And here's what I can tell you for sure. Sometimes I want to speak into their lives and God uses something else. He can use a tree to provide oil through the power of His Spirit because it's not by my power or my might. You do the best you can do, but you recognize that God has other ways of meeting needs besides you. Can I get an amen on that one? So the provision of God is there. When I get down to chapter 5, I'm so... I'm so stunned. Now, again, here's another one of these visions in verses 1 through 4. I saw this huge flying scroll, 15 by 30 feet. Okay, I think that deserves some attention. And it contained a judgment against thieves and hypocrites, and God swore to use it in judgment against them both. Here's the thing. Just like God provides behind the scene, God also demands purging behind the scene. There's also a demand that God has that I'm not just providing for you and pouring out my spirit on you so that you can just have more and use more and be more. I want you to walk with me. And if you're not going to follow my word, I'm going to keep throwing my word at you. I mean, 15 by 30 Bibles coming at you. I want you to be aware. So God won't only deal with believers. It's interesting. If you keep reading in verses 5 through 11 of chapter 5, he goes even beyond that. He says, not only are believers that are not walking with me and not only my people when they're committing crimes are in, in my crosshairs, but even the world out there that is seen in the pagan system still answers to me. Here's what he says. He says, I saw this woman and she was in an ephah container. Just put her in a, in a kind of a big uh, 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 pottery container. And she was inside, and the top was lead sealed. And the angels lifted her away to the land of Shinar, that's into the Assyrian territory, to be released when her own temple was prepared. And, and you stand there and you go, why in the world is God showing him little girls in pots? 
But that woman was going to raise up a temple and fill it with a pagan system. And it was going to be spread into an area that was literally going to corrupt a people. And, and it was not moving anywhere until God signed off on it. It's hard for us to understand why God just doesn't put a stop to evil. And his answer is, because I'm not done yet. I have a story to tell, and I'm going to develop all of the characters, and it's going to drive you nuts for how long I'm going to let some of those characters live. Deal with it. I'm God. And so literally, an angelic patrol was sent to, fl to, to, to go out and drop this woman off. Chapter 6 opens with another one of these patrols. The angelic patrol was sent to free Babylonian captives and bring them back to appease God's justice. And so in 6, 1 through 7, it says that, that there was a predetermined point in God's mind when he was going to draw them back. Look, look at these words in verses 1 through 7. This is my version. I saw four chariots move through a pass between two bronze mountains. An angel told me that each chariot moved to patrol an area of the earth. Black horses went to the north country and prevailed to appease God's wrath in that area. If you read those verses, you will come down to this understanding. There are two worlds. They are interacting with each other. God is pulling off of a plan. And while that's going on, the enemy's going after leaders, hitting them hard. God is providing behind the scenes a supply line that the enemy can't figure out. And in the middle of all of that, even evil doesn't go anywhere unless God signs off and says, all right, I'll let that happen, I'll let that happen, I'll let that happen. Now, that doesn't answer all your questions about life, but that's what Zechariah gives us. And what I see is, if you keep reading, you go to the second section here in 6, 9 through 15. After chapter 3 says that God had used spiritual help to change the uniform of Joshua, it says that God spoke to Zechariah in chapter 6, verses 9 to 15, and said, take an offering from the return exiles of silver and gold, form a crown for Joshua. Proclaim him the branch that will build this temple and rule as both the priest and the ruler. The crown is going to remind the exiles that other people outside will complete this work and not them. What, what God says is, I want you to go to the exiles and I want you to pull money that Joshua doesn't have. I want you to get it together, make it into a crown, put it on his head and let him know there's more out there than he knows. Who doesn't understand that? Sometimes we feel like the team's getting beat up and we forget that God has more on the team than we see. We walk around with that, you know, Jeremiah complex. I alone, Lord, I alone. We do that Elijah, you know, I just don't. Nobody's out there with me, God. You have no idea. God says, you know, I'm running the whole planet. You don't see the whole playing board. I only showed you part of it. Joshua needed to be picked up. He needed to have God multiply the ranks when needed and show him that God had a way of opening and expanding. You know God knows how to raise a victorious army. Do you know that God's not on the ropes getting beat up by evil? That, that, that at any moment he can put a stop to all of this. He chooses not to. Now, you get down to chapter 7 and 8, and if just look at how this works. Once you understand there are two worlds interfacing, and once you understand that there's confusion always about the leadership because the enemy's pounding away on the leadership and discouraging them, then you get to honest confusion over people who are reading their Bible but don't get it. Does everybody understand that one? Some, sometimes it's not that they're under spiritual attack, it's that they don't understand what they're reading. So in chapters 7 and 8, there's a confusion that exists in ministry. Why? There's 1,189 chapters in the Bible. It's got some content. Somewhere along the way, we're not all going to agree on every verse. So you might have heard we have some disagreements among us. You might have heard that even if we all agree that it's absolutely the truth, and that's only a segment of us, even when we agree with that, we don't always know what it said. So we're trying our best. And so in chapter 7, verse 2, it says that the town of Bethel had sent Sharetzer and Ragamelech and their men to seek the favor of the Lord. I, I'm, I'm interested because these guys show up and they want to do what's right with God. And it says, they spoke to the priests who belonged to the house of the Lord of hosts and to the prophets and said, shall I weep on the fifth month and abstain as I have done these many years? Here's the problem. We're used to having a whole series of fasts as Jewish people at this time. 
So they had a fast in the fourth month for when there was a breach in the walls of Jerusalem. They had a fast in the fifth month for when there was a burning of God's uh, temple. They had a, a weeping and a fast when, uh, for Gedaliah's assassination in the seventh month. They had all these fasts. They had another one when Nebuchadnezzar began his siege in the tenth month. Over and over, they had all these fasts of what had happened before they were taken into captivity. Now here's the question. We got a new temple, or at least we're getting one. It's just starting to get really exciting. Should we keep fasting or do we start celebrating? And you go, what does that have to do with me? Well, it's very simple. How quickly do you jettison a memory of your sinfulness and what it costs the Lord and move to grace and celebration? Because the quicker you do it, the more you'll be inclined to lessen the actual weightiness of your sin. But the longer you do it, the more you'll be inclined to treat Jesus as if he wasn't enough. It's the same problem. We have to try and figure out, should we keep recalling our disciplined weeping or should we put it behind us? Should we move on? So the point of chapter 7 was to help the people get out of this kind of uh, cage of we just feel bad and we keep feeling bad, so we got to feel bad. And so what he says is the word of the Lord of the host came to him saying, Say to all the people of the land, I'm in verse 5, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and the seventh month these 70 years, was it actually for me? The very first question we have to ask is when we go through these religious things that we do, were we doing it for God? Because honestly, a lot of times we get caught up in the sadness of the event or the celebration of an event, and it's really not about God. The soul mimics the spirit. The spirit is your umbilical attachment to God. The soul is your personality. And a lot of what people call worship isn't. It's actually a great emotional experience that you could have had at a Rolling Stones concert if you liked their music. What, but what people say is, is spiritual is often emotional. We have to separate it. So there's another one in verse 8. He says, listen, if you don't want to have to do all those festivals, and all those uh, fasting anymore, you want to move on to the festivals and celebrations, here's what I want you to do in verse 8. Dispense true justice, practice kindness and compassion each to his brother. In other words, show me that change is really happening in your life and then I won't need all those old reminders. One of the problems we have is we walk around with reminders of our past life because we throw them off so fast, we no longer act like that was us. Uh, have, have, do you have that ability? I don't know what I was thinking back then. As if you have no responsibility for it. The rest of chapter 7 really calls you to face the fact that as you look back, there were things in your life that God has saved you from. He's taken care of those things. Now you get to chapter 8 and it says, The word of the Lord of hosts came saying, Thus says the Lord, I am exceedingly jealous for Zion. Down in verse 4, Old men, old women will sit again in the streets of Jerusalem. You know what? Chapter 8 reminds me of something. It reminds me that believers can celebrate now for things that we don't yet have simply based on the fact that God promised them. When God says, I'm going to do something for you, take it to the bank. It's as good as done. So if he says, there's a future for Jerusalem and it's going to be great, you can honestly start your celebrations right now because it's going to be great. Now, it doesn't mean they're not going to have to go through a really tough time. But that's why verse 9 says, let your hands be strong, you who are listening in these days to these words from the mouths of the prophets. That's why verse 11 says, but now I will not treat the remnant of this people as the former days, declares the Lord. Verse, all the way down at the end of verse 13, I will save you that you may become a blessing. Do not fear, let your hands be strong. The Bible calls you, when you know what God has said, to work from victory, not for victory. Jesus provides the victory. God provides the victory. You work from it. Now, you had, to, you had to live in Jerusalem for a while to really understand this concept, but every Thursday night, we got Monday night football for many years. Now, you can't believe the confidence you bring to Monday night football when it's on Thursday night from last Monday's tape. When you know who won, 
You don't even care if they sack your quarterback in five, with five minutes left. You don't care if they carry off the field in pieces your three favorite receivers because you're going to win. How do you know? Because the tape is already made. If we would think that way about our walk with God and understand the tape is already made when God said it, then we work from victory, not for victory. Now, that's the first half of the book, and you understand why they were confused about whether or not they should stay in the weight of the past. The second half of the book are the series of predictions, and I only have a few minutes to do them, but they're actually not that difficult. When you go to chapter 9, there are five pronouncements in chapter 9 that help me to understand what it's all about. The first one is a world power in verses 1 through 4, which is Syria. And the second one is smaller allies of that power, verses 5 through 7. That's the Philistine city. So God is going to address the Syrians and the Philistines as he turns and says, I have something coming for you guys. Then in verse 8, he's going to pay attention specifically to Jerusalem and God's protection for his temple. But the verses you probably know are 9, 9 through 12, because those seem to most directly relate to the first coming of Jesus. Your king comes riding to you humbly on a donkey. And you see that in Luke 19, and it evokes this whole imagery from Zechariah 9, 9. The last part of chapter 9 is the weird part. Because the last part of chapter 9 actually addresses the coming of the Greeks long before Alexander the Great was a thing. This is 520, 515. Alexander the Great, 333. So predictive prophecy steps right in and it actually uses the word Greece. Greece was not a dominating power at this time. They were, however, experiencing the golden age of Greece and the per Periclean a Athens and some good things were going on in the period, but they weren't yet a marching power anywhere near Israel. So here's what I see. If you take nine and you take those, those uh, five pronouncements, let me lump them into four stages. The first stage is seven verses, 9, 1 through 7, and it's God's people began in darkness, surrounded by people of darkness. Syria didn't have a heart for God. Lebanon didn't have a heart for God. Philistines certainly didn't have a heart for God. But zero in on verse 7. I will remove their blood from their mouth and their detestable things from between their teeth. Then they also will be a remnant for our God. In other words, in the process of God saving his people, he was going to save some of the most detestable people around them. There is, an, uh, there is an effect of God moving into a room and changing a life. It actually affects the people around it. And the second stage, after God uh, beginning with his people in darkness, is in verses 8 all the way down to verse 12, which is God breaking into a mess. This is what he says, I will camp around my house. No oppressor will pass over it anymore. And then he says, your king will come riding to you with, endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey. And of course, you recognize that for the Palm Sunday and Jesus coming into the city. But I want you to notice one other verse that you might have skipped over. Look at verse 11. As also for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I have set your prisoners free. So there is a coming of a king who will come in humility and in his coming around that time, the prophecy will talk about a blood of my covenant that sets prisoners free. It's worth going back and exploring uh, this text again. What I can tell you is this, that God will save his people and at the end of chapter 9 it says the Lord of hosts will defend them and they will devour and trample on the sling stones. Look at verse 16, the, the Lord their God will save them in that day as the flock of the people. Chapter 9 simply makes the argument that God's going to deal with Syria, the Philistines, and he's going to surprise everybody by saving some of them then God is going to protect his city, Jerusalem. Then God is going to send his servant, Messiah, and that in doing that, he's going to save his people. So chapter 9 is one of those places in the first coming of Jesus you want to come back, and that's why the gospel writer quotes from Zechariah 9. Go to chapter 10 for a minute. Because in chapter 10, God warned his people to keep the eyes on the promises. See, the prophetic story is God's plan for Israel. And, and by the time they completed the second temple, here's the problem. You get to chapter 10, and the temple's operating. They've already finished. They don't need, they don't need encouragement to get it going. It's going. 
Uh, the northern brothers are lost in the sands of time. The days of David and Solomon long ago are gone. Now they got this broken down temple that they've rebuilt, whoop de doo and they don't feel really good about themselves. They are totally informed and absolutely not inspired. And if you've ever been to that point in your walk with God, they are full of information, lacking inspiration. God told the people that he was going to do something. He says, hey, it's time for the spring rain in chapter 10. And he says, the grain harvest is ready. And the prophets uh, use the latter rain for the time of, uh, of, of the end times. And God says to the Jewish people in chapter 10, verse 5, that a Messiah will come from you. That a fighting force is going to be raised up that will drive other people more equipped away from you. You cannot read chapter 10 and not be excited about your own news. Listen to this. There's going to come a time when people are going to re-inhabit Jerusalem, verse 7, and they're going to dance in the streets after they've been gone a long time. Verse 8, I'm going to continually pull them home in waves to the land, and the land is going to be huge again, even though it was a hundred years before, empty of people. You're going to see that though they were sown into the nations in 10.9, they will be distinct when they return. They will not amalgamate into the nations they went to. They will still be Jewish people. That's pretty amazing. They're going to come from many lands, verse 10, and be stuffed into a small land. But after they get there, verse 11, there will be a great tribulation that comes upon them because of their enemies. And finally, I'm going to renew them, and they're going to walk in Messiah's name. Listen to verse 12. I will strengthen them in the Lord, and in his name they will walk, declares the Lord. Just like chapter 9 tells you about the coming of Messiah and the first coming, chapter 10 tells you about the restoration of the Jewish people coming back to the land after a long time away. Now, chapter 11 scolds the shepherds that were over top of them. In fact, God says he pardons real repentance, but he will make no rejection on the hard-hearted leaders and shepherds of Israel that will not repent. And if I had to look at chapter 11 under a microscope, I would set it next to Jesus weeping over the city of Jerusalem because the leaders of the Jewish people, corrupt and unwilling to follow, spurned him. And that's why he says things from the Mount of Olives like, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I've longed to gather you as a hen would gather her chicks, but you would not come. Jerusalem, who stones the prophets, I send you. Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. There will come a day when you'll wish you'd never given birth. There was a steadiness in chapter 11, a powerful nature that the flock was being led by shepherds that were false. And Zechariah was called to shepherd a flock that was doomed for slaughter. Now, that sounds so ominous, but you have to remember that when, uh, in the time in which they were living, that's why they were raising the animals. They were going to kill them. That's what they were for. But here, it's a time when he goes out and in verse 10 of chapter 11, he said, I took a staff uh, a favor and cut it in pieces to break my covenant, which I had made with my people. There was a generation coming of shepherds of Israel where God was going to break the staffs of those shepherds and the agreement with them and kick the ball to another future generation of Jews later. And Jesus did it. He looked right at them and said, I cannot I cannot accept that you reject me and still offer you the kingdom that I want to offer you. So it's going to go to another of your ancestors, somebody later. Somebody who is going to come from the same line. It'll be part of the Jewish people. I will do what I said, but you won't be part of it. And chapter 11 is the sadness of that moment. It's interesting. Did you notice in chapter 11, verse 12, it says, I said to them, if it is good in your sight, give me my wages. If not, never mind. They weighed out 30 shekels of silver as my wages. Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the magnificent price at which I was valued by them. You know what they're doing? Adding insult to injury. They didn't pay him his normal due. Rather, they substituted for it the price of a gourd bond servant according to Exodus 21. And you see that same 
set of things happening where? In the Gospels, right? Matthew 27, they give Judas 30 pieces of silver and he buys with it a potter's field. There's a whole backstory, and the backstory is simply this. When the leaders of Israel, as shepherds of Israel, refuse to walk with God, God lifts his hands from those leaders and says, I'll give it to future leaders. You won't get the blessing. You know, one of the things that I know about the Lord over the years I've, I've walked with him is this. If you spurn God's call in your life, he'll hand it to somebody else. That's what he'll do. If you try putting your armor on the next kid, like Saul did to David, then God will give the kingdom to David. If you don't want the job, he won't give it to you. If you won't walk with him, he'll take it away. Okay, look at the last part. Because the, that, those all talk about things that are related to the first coming. In the last part of the book, there's a powerful pummeling of judgment that's told in three steps. 12, 13, 14. In chapter 12, you might not have seen it, but I've been guiding your life and guiding your nation since the beginning, says the Lord. In chapter 13, false teachers have traded, cheated, broken you, but I'm going to rescue you. And then 14, there's a powerful destruction coming as the kingdoms of this world come up against you because they don't want me, says the Lord God. Go to chapter 12 for just a minute. And what you'll see is that the burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel, thus declares the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. The process God uses to reach into a life is systematically revealed. If you read this passage, it will keep using this phrase, in that day, and another phrase, it will come about. When you first look at human history, it looks like a series of mistakes and happenstance. When you look at it through predictive prophecy, you realize that God says, okay, next, okay, next, okay, next. I want you to know that in chapter 12, he tells the story of how he's going to reach his people after a long, hard, stiff neck. You want to apply it to your life? It's very simple. How did God reach you? How did God reach you when you weren't walking with him and didn't want to? You didn't even know you needed to. Well, chapter 12 says that it all began with a, a stirring, 12, 2 to 5. All of a sudden, the symbols uh, at the heart of world agitation start being you. Your city is going to become a problem for people around the world. I, I, when you read 2 through 5, you can't help but look, pick up a newspaper and know that Jerusalem has become a major problem for everybody in the world. And here's a, he says, you know what? When the last days come, I'm going to make Jerusalem a problem for everybody in the world. How shocking. And then he says, in that day, verse 4 declares, Lord, I'm going to strike every horse with bewilderment, rider with madness. I'm going to watch over the house of Judah. Here's what's going to happen. People are going to come up with stronger armies and not beat you. They'd have took them if they could take them. But the Lord stood for them. And verse, verse 6, it says, In that day I'm going to make the clans of Judah like a fire pot among the pieces of wood and a flaming torch among the sheaves. The Lord, verse 7, will save the tents of Judah first so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem will not be magnified above Judah. He says, I've got a plan for my people and I've got a plan for my city and I'm going to start saving them in inordinate ways that don't make sense. You're going to look at it and you're going to go, how is that happening? And as the last time comes upon them, you're going to see it again. I'm going to show up at key moments and I'm going to actually drive the forces of history in ways that are shocking to people. What's interesting is verse 8 says, in that day the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David. In other words, people that shouldn't have strength will be empowered to be able to pull off things they shouldn't be able to pull off. God says, all of a sudden, verse 9, in that day I will set about to destroy the, the nations that come against Jerusalem. I'm going to pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Verse 11, in that day there will be great mourning in Jerusalem like the mourning of Hadramon in the plains of Megiddo. He says what's going to happen is I'm going to get to the place where I box Israel in. I box Jerusalem in. I press the Jewish people to where their back is to the sea. There's nowhere for them to escape. And then I will have them understand I am their God. What does salvation look like? Well, in chapter 13, verse 1, it looks like cleansing that comes from a fountain. Do you remember that the 
nations will box in Israel. Their back will be to the, ski, to the sea. They will not be able to escape, and they will look on him whom they have pierced. He will come in the clouds, and they will weep. 13 tells me this. It tells me that the fountain of cleansing will be opened up. When did it get opened up? Well, don't skip it. Back in 12.9, he said, I'm about to destroy the nations that come up against them. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one who mourns for an only son for they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. This is chapter 12, verse 10. And when you look at that, here's what he says. He says, when there's nowhere for them to go, then I will appear. Then they will weep. Then they will drop. Then they will cry. Then they will identify me as a son. They will understand what has happened. So 13.1 says that's when a fountain of purity comes. Why? Because that's when people are saved. When Paul said in Romans 10 and 11, so all Israel will be saved, he meant so all Israel will be saved. That's a future tense for Paul. It's something after the church. It's something still yet to come. How does it happen? It happens after a tribulation, when they're surrounded by the world that hates them. It happens when the Messiah breaks through the clouds in the second coming and they look on him whom they have pierced. It's interesting because once they fall before him, 13.2 tells me that the idols are cut off from the land. 13.3 says that, that people understand that the prophets are, and prophecy is a holy thing. 13.4 says that it will come about in that day that the prophets will each be ashamed of the vision which he prophesies and they will not put on a hairy robe in order to deceive. Right is going to be right. Wrong is going to be wrong. People are going to know that you don't play at this anymore. Listen, when you see them break through the clouds, when your whole nation is about to be extinguished and you are saved by the skin of your teeth, you don't put on a little religious dance and start going back to your practice as usual. You fall before God. And that's it. When chapter 13 closes, it closes with a surrender. And chapter 14 opens this way. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, the, city, the houses plundered, women ravished, half the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. In other words... God says in 14, yes, I told you, you're going to be surrounded. Yes, I told you, I'm going to save you. Let me go back to that again. You're going to take heavy, heavy losses on the way. It's not going to be simple. Most people will doubt that I'm ever going to save you. I'm going to save you. 14.4 says in the day in which he does that, he will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem to the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle from east to west, a very large valley, so half the mountain will move to the north, the other half will move to the south as that east-west split sort of cracks it open and breaks it open. And the resourcefulness of God takes people by surprise because in that day, there's no need for light because luminaries will dwindle and, and it will be a unique day which is known to the Lord. Neither day nor night. It will come about in the evening that it will still be light. God will move whatever he has to move, change whatever he has to change. He's going to make sure that everybody knows, I am the Lord. This is my people. Any questions? And he's going to make sure that it's not going to be something where people are going to go, hey, I wonder if they just somehow invented some new cool weapon. They will know. Verse 8 says, In that day living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea, the other half toward the western sea, half toward the dead, half toward the med. And then it says, It will be in summer as well as in winter. That's hard for you to understand, but there are only two rivers in Israel that actually run all year long, the Jordan and the Arkon, and the Arkon's only a few hundred meters long. So it says, Another one that runs all year long. Jerusalem will have its own sen. Maybe it'll have a river cruise like they have in Paris, you know, have the guys with boats. Come on, it's an industry. Um, but here's what it says. There will always, always, always be water flowing out of there. And then he says, I'm going to move the land around and landscape around. And verse 12 says, now this will be 
uh, be the plague with the Lord. He will strike all the peoples who have gone to war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets. Their tongue will rot in their mouth. What you're looking at is what happens at Armageddon. It happens not only in the plain of Armageddon, it happens also in Jerusalem. And he says it's the same problem when the nations gather around. We close this book with a very simple word from God. He says that in verse 16, it will come about that any who are left of the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Booths. And it will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there'll be no rain on them. Why? Because at the Feast of Tabernacles, you pray for rain for the coming year. And it says if the family of Egypt doesn't go up to enter, they don't get any rain. That will be the punishment for Egypt. And then he closes out the entire powerful pummeling at the end of the book that says there's going to be war, there's going to be losses, there's going to be destruction, there's going to be surrounding of you, you're going to be choked off, but I'm going to come and I'm going to save you. And he ends it this way. In that day, verse 20, there will be inscribed on the bells of horses, holy to the Lord, and the cooking pots in the Lord's house will be like the bowls before the altar. Every cooking pot in Jerusalem and in Judah will be holy to the Lord of hosts. All who sacrifice will come and take of them and boil in them, and there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts in that day. In other words, I will straighten out my people, and every one of them in their homes will be observing as, as, as uh, precisely as they are in the temple itself. They won't just be doing this for show, it'll be real. They will have seen what it means to go through, the, uh, to be the enemy of the nations. They will have endured thousands of years of anti-Semitism. They will go through a pain that is horrible and unbelievable. Revelation 16 says it's worse than any judgment that it has ever preceded it for the Jewish people. But at the end, every one alive at the time when the Messiah breaks through the clouds, every single Jewish person alive on that day will look on him whom they have pierced, and they will be saved. It's a good story. It's also a powerfully hard one. So there's a pummeling coming, but it ends in God's promise, a promise yet to be fulfilled, according to Paul, a promise yet in their future. But here's what I know about God's promises. We can celebrate today because God said it will happen then. It's as good as done. One of the nice things about working among the Jewish people is I, I'm in one of the few fields of the world that gets a 100% retention salvation at the end. Now, it's true, it's only one generation and uh, very likely I won't see them. But here's the thing I can tell you. God will move players around the field for a thousand years to make a point. He is in no hurry, he's incredibly patient, and he loves Israel and has loved them from the beginning. And even though this story is a difficult one to tell, and it is, here's what I know. There is an unseen world behind what's going on in our world today. This is the symptom. That's the reality. There's a plan in place. There's a culmination of that plan. And at the end of the story, God will say, this is who I am, signed in blood. It's the blood of grace, the blood of mercy, the blood of the Son that will return, over whom they will weep. Zechariah. I don't have.